So my project is a, an assessment of coastal flood communication mechanisms, um, putting, uh, doing a case study in Imperial Beach. So in the low-lying community of Imperial Beach, California, much of the community is projected to be impacted by sporadic, uh, few-hour wave-driven coastal flooding events. Um, most of the flooding in Imperial Beach occurs when intense winter swells combine with high tides. Um, and it also is adjacent to the floodplain of the Tijuana River estuary, making it particularly vulnerable to these uh, short-lived high tide uh, flooding events. Uh, Short-term solutions such as beach nourishments, groins, um, river management, and other co coastal armoring techniques have been either implemented or proposed over the years. Um, however, a sea level rise um, enhanced high tide flooding is projected to um, impact California's communities um, almost daily by 2100. It's really vital that we, um, these communities are able to understand and plan for these uh, more extreme water level events. So when considering these future risks of sea level rise in the face of a changing climate, understanding how we can best articulate and disseminate coastal flood science and impacts to those who most directly um, experience, respond to, and plan for these events is really critical. Um, while researchers have focused on a better comprehension of coastal flood um, impacts and how communities can best respond to these uh, present and future hazards, uh, the science is often technical and requires some sufficient understanding of global, regional, and local climatic or oceanic influences. So, to combat this, a lot of researchers and organizations have attempted to bridge these knowledge gaps um, uh, and simplify the science of sea level rise and coastal flooding uh, through educational resources and data visualization tools or other communication mechanisms. So this project seeks to work with um, Imperial Beach uh, flood hazard responders and city planners to identify opportunities and limitations of communication, uh, data synthesis, and uh, community engagement. Uh, what makes Imperial Beach such a great case study uh, to explore communication is their long-lasting uh, long uh, partnership with uh, Scripps Institute of Ocean Institution of Oceanography. Um, the relationship utilizes the vast resources and research capabilities uh, at Scripps to provide technical assistance to Imperial Beach in better uh, preparing and mitigating coastal flood impacts to their community. Um, with, with all this um, flood data being collected in Imperial Beach um, by Scripps, the, the goal is to work with these stakeholders that actually respond to these, uh, these flood hazards to identify opportunities to improve how we communicate projects and findings and how we can better share that information as well. So this study focuses on these four sites here in Imperial Beach um, where minor and moderate flood thresholds have been established. Um, those sites are at the end of Seacoast Drive, Encanto Avenue, Descanso Avenue, and Cortez Avenue. And this assessment focused on these three key components of communication, historical flooding, short-term flood forecasting, and projections of future flood frequency. So this assessment was broken up into five phases, uh, phase one being a review of the flood risk literature and tools that are available in Imperial Beach. Um, in order to study how flooding is changing over time, we need to better comprehend how these events um, have affected the community in the past. So communicating past flooding events provides us with a valuable baseline to better understand how these changes um, in flood risk are occurring. Um, so in the Imperial Beach Resilient Futures tool, uh, this allows users uh, to explore past events in Imperial Beach and sort of has a historical record there as well. Um, to understand communication of uh, present threats, uh, Scripps has developed a flood forecast system in Imperial Beach. This information allows users to identify when minor and moderate flood thresholds are breached, um, and you can, and it does so uh, about five days ahead of time, and this information is communicated via email as well as through their online tool. And then to understand future flood vulnerability, uh, many projection tools are available, and these resources um, to project these future risks are constantly growing and expanding. Um, all these tools project different metrics um, and are all catered to different audiences, but none of these tools pre present this information as it's relevant to Imperial Beach and consolidate it in a way that is more widely um, accessible and comprehensible. So in phase three, I developed an interactive story map tool um, that was intended to consolidate this Imperial Beach uh, flood risk data, um, and that was titled um, Flood Ready IB. 
So in the beginning, there's more introductory level um, uh, information here. What are the risks to Imperial Beach? Um, what are these drivers? And what is the different methodology used in Imperial Beach um, to study these flood events? And then for the historical record, I had data from 2000 to 2022, um, and that was a wave and tide data to create um, total water level events, just the um, water level at the shoreline. And I found the, where all of these events exceeded those flood thresholds and created this interactive guide for users to explore when those events were breached. Um, if you want to see where those sites um, breached those more moderate flood thresholds, you can do so um, doing this. And that information is also consolidated in a single graph here. Then for short-term flood forecasting, I wanted to simplify the validation process of these uh, flood events. Uh, first, you're notified. Second, you prepare the necessary flood measures. And then third, you want to um, document that event and upload photos with an upload feature there. Um, as well as I wanted to create some physical characteristics of what these different flood thresholds mean, um, definitions as well as those photos paired there as well. And then for future flood frequency, um, I use that same historical, uh, fl historical flooding database and then add one uh, meter of sea level rise just to show that compounding impact of um, sea level rise to these flood events. And then once I finished that tool, I wanted to present it to Imperial Beach and gather their feedback on that, um, as well as um, some guiding questions um, to basically understand the effectiveness of different flood risk communication. Um, so I use these, uh, these seven questions here to serve as a collaborative dialogue to sort of guide this conversation um, to identify where science communication, data dissemination, and public education could be improved. Um, this feedback session um, in consisted of both uh, Chris Helmer, who's the Director of Environment and Natural Resources, as well as Megan Openshaw, who's the Director of Community Development. So finally, based on their feedback paired with some of the flood risk communication and climate risk communication literature available, um, I was able to identify some limitations and opportunities of these different communication mechanisms. And then first, for historical, um, most residents have some experience of flooding in Imperial Beach, um, but then again, not all flooding is the same. Um, understanding how to communicate what is flooding from groundwater, what's flooding from El Nino, King Tides, or um, these large wave events was really a key limitation um, in this communication. Uh, so being able to communicate what drivers, um, what drivers will, were, what drivers give us, um, sorry, what drivers influence these events will give us better insight into how these um, flooding events are changing over time. Um, then most of these flood events use historical data that simulates these actual events. So these models aren't perfect, um, actually, if you take a look at the chart above, I, I found all of those flood days over that 22-year period, um, and we see almost half of the year flooding. So what we found was it's really vital to pair this data with actual on-the-ground observed events, um, uh, just so you know whether this be photos, videos, or other forms of media, just those observations were really vital. Um, and in this sense, the Resilient Futures tool was um, did this really well and was successful in communicating both those records paired with those uh, photos and videos of those past events. And then for the flood forecast tool, we found that this tool was ultimately really useful for fostering collaboration between the researchers and stakeholders, as well as enhancing uh, uh, these hazard, flood hazard response times as well. Um, they specified that these uh, mild events were helpful to know, uh, but did not necessarily elicit much of a significant response, whereas these more um, severe events, when those were projected, um, uh, public safety teams were able to be notified, they were able to engage in an emergency preparedness plan, um, and then as that event uh, became, as that event approached, they were able to um, basically have this potential plan days ahead of time and decide if those on the ground conditions actually elicited these, this more significant response. And then one limitation of this, um, of this forecast tool was sort of the way we communicate what constitutes this mild, mild or moderate flooding and what those different things mean and also how those are gonna be changing over time. 
Um, they hi staff highlighted uh, concerns of changing offshore and nearshore topography and how these events may alter these different flood magnitudes. Uh, they specified that these flood events have already transitioned from um, a maintenance nuisance of uh, cleaning up sand out of the roads um, to a public safety hazard where now these more frequently uh, cobble exposed beaches have the added threat of waves, um, aerial cobbles, aerial cobbles um, being thrown by waves. So. Although the current warning system is also sent to an audience that can easily comprehend the data here, um, such as researchers, coastal specialists, people that are really literate in this information, um, should this information be more widely um, accessible to the public, further uh, education and outreach may be required. Uh, the literature emphasizes that these flood warning systems should provide um, concise and easily accessible um, data that is paired with written warnings, graphics, maps, or other visuals. And in this sense, the, the forecast system uh, effectively communicated those threats. Um, however, the, the staff really emphasized the need for increased literacy in the community and public perception. Um, so uh, more frequent uh, workshops and town halls led by these uh, scripts experts um, um, could help increase that risk perception in the community. And uh, this information is better communicated by those um, experts here at Scripps rather than the government staff in Imperial Beach. Then finally, for future uh, flood frequency projections, um, many of these tools um, focused on more intangible uh, solutions, uh, focusing on whether uh, worst case scenarios or more long-term projections. Um, staff hi highlighted that they were more likely to plan adaptive measures um, for these more regular, um, more regular and realistic flood events. Additionally, most of these projections uh, highlighted impacts and risks uh, by 2100, which many of these residents consider maybe not within their lifetime or sort of um, not within reach. So instead, Imperial Beach staff really emphasized a need to communicate these more near-term near regular impacts, um, highlighting information like tipping points of more gradual flooding to more rapid increase of uh, flood frequency um, was more useful from a planning perspective. Um, and communicating these events can essentially serve as a checkpoint in sea level rise projections and help solutions feel more, um, and impacts feel more relevant and uh, actionable. And however, many of these uh, projections are defined uh, based on the, many of these uh, tipping points projections are based on definitions of a flood day. Um, and a flood day is essentially any day that has at least one hour of flooding, um, aka any day where these flood thresholds are exceeded. So that means um, one hour of minor flooding um, would, consider, would be considered a flood day. Also several hours of more moderate flooding um, is also considered a flood day. So obviously the impacts and response of those two different things um, would be very different. So this is a key limitation um, in, to consider. So in conclusion, um, historic flood communication uh, through um, data paired with these media of observed events um, effectively highlighted uh, coastal flood risks. Um, and then the short-term Forecast tools are useful for flood response, uh, but increased public uh, engagement and collaboration could also provide insight on how these flood risks are changing, um, how this, the risk perception within the community and what language um, could be used. Uh, projection of future flood frequency. Um, these models of future vulnerability and frequency are valuable tools for providing a guideline for adaptive planning but risk communication should focus on more realistic and tangible uh, projections as well. So thank you so much for all being here. Um, I know it's been a long day. Um, I want to take a, a moment to give a special thank you to my capstone uh, committee advisors, um, Laura Engeman, who is my chair, uh, Julia Fiedler, um, and then Chris Helmer, who may be on here, or maybe <laughs> not, um, and also everyone here, of course, uh, for being here, and the capstone, or the cohort here, who like was very helpful to me in sort of um, uh, me, my neurotic thoughts. So I really appreciate <laughs> everyone here. So, any.
Who got questions? <laughs> That's cool. So I know that your um, project was mainly on adaptation. Mm. And I'm curious what you think about like mitigation for flood events in somewhere like Imperial Beach? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was more about uh, communicating flood risk to open up these avenues of adaptation or mitigation. I think that both serve their purpose. Um, I think the reality is, you know, the water's coming. Um, and, and we just need to know how these communities can adjust um, to these, especially these low-lying communities can adjust to those types of risks. Um, you mentioned how flood days, the definition can really vary between like a moderate flood day to something that actually has a lot of implications. Are there any, like is there work, any work going on to making that more specific or different variations of flood days, do you know? Uh, well, there's definitely a lot of different definitions of what that means, and there's also a lot of different understandings of what that means. Um, what I'm focusing on is mostly this NASA uh, projections tool, um, and a uh, flood day projection tool, rather. Um, and in that sense, that, that was basically the definition I was, I was utilizing. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of different definitions. All of these uh, coastal flooding terms, um, as you start sort of peeling back the layers. There's a lot of different understandings, you know, things people um, describing things like inundation and flooding sort of interchangeably when um, those definitions in other places are mean very different things. So um, yeah, a lot of these, this terminology um, sort of complicates this bigger issue. As, yeah, there we go. Uh, as you're talking about communications, I was thinking about infrastructure for other public safety things, and I was thinking about like amber alerts or mm -hmm. air quality index alerts. Um, when it comes to notifying the public, did you find any communications infrastructure that was actually useful for that, for the percentage of people around the world that live within totally. coasts? Yeah, yeah, so, so that, that information, um, in summary, all of this, I just didn't really touch on it. All of this information is really audience dependent and it, you can't really have these overarching um, generalizations in um, what these different you know, communication outlets are. Um, you really need to understand what the community um, like perceives in sense of risks, um, what is sort of more easily uh, understood and what language people are using and you know, what you know, if are p even are people using um, email communication, text messages, more, you know, things like that. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's really dependent on the audience, though. <laughs>